<laughs> trying to figure this one out. Get this one organized right. But I've been feeling real under the weather lately. Which, if I'm going to get sick, believe me, it always seems to be right around this time of year. Usually the winter months. And uh, over the years, I've gradually become accustomed to and enjoy this season. You know, the season of Christmas, of Grinch, of Hanukkah, of Kwanzaa, of Mary this and Mary that, of Yuletide joys, of... Christmas carols and hay rides, of laughing and singing and dancing, of rejoicing, of spending quality time that I used to spend in personal time with my God, but quality time with others to inspire them to enjoy Christmas as it is, the way it is, not get involved and embroiled in some battleground between happy holidays because they are happy holidays and Merry Christmas because it is a Merry Christmas because the truth is nobody can tell you what to do nobody can tell you what not to do only you can because it's you now God may tell you what he wants you to do and with free will and freedom of choice you'll still make the decision yourself what you're going to do and based upon what I know about humanity you're probably not going to do whatever God tells you to do, because that's the human way. But the godly way is to yield to Him and let His will be done. But I've learned that the consequences of my choice is, are less and so when I make myself applicable to the Word of God and how He can make things work out for good that I might have thought were evil. Now. The reason I say that is because I've never thought of Christmas as evil. No offense to anybody out there that, you know, is into this, you know, Saturnalia and all the other, you know, pagan, Roman, Egyptian, Byzantine, uh, trying to think, like Babylonian, Egyptian demigods that, you know, we supposedly are superstitious enough to believe that somehow they're connected. <laughs> And there may be a little tiny fact that the God of this world is influencing some things, but the God of this world is only an angel. I'm sorry. He's not so big as our God. you got to remember that, you know. When it says angels we have heard on high, it's not satanic angels we heard on high. It's God's messengers that we heard on high. And when God decides to intervene, like he did at the birth of his son, even though the world was evil, and it was because... At the birth of Jesus, the world came out of its way to kill all the children that were in Bethlehem at that time, up until the third year of age. And so God spared his son by sending an angel to Joseph and Mary and appearing in a dream to Joseph to tell them to go to Egypt to spare the child. And so there is a certain amount of evil that's around a lot of this season, but Christmas isn't evil. Christmas isn't the problem. The problem is you. What are you doing? What are you hearing? And what do you see? Because there is a hope that was given to us at this time of season, and that's why people generate so much joy at this time of year because they take great hope in the realization that God might be real. Now, for those of us who know God is real, we have no problem with this hope because this hope is the time of the year. It's the hope of peace on earth, goodwill towards men, because God has given us great tidings, glad tidings of great joy which shall be unto all men. So you see, the tidings wasn't for some men, and it wasn't for only believers, and it wasn't for only Christians, and it wasn't for only Jews, but it was glad tidings of great joy for all men. So, it's not only a season of 
Jesus being born and trying to kind of like make it into a birthday celebration, which I don't think Jesus would be much into. But it's meant to be glad tidings of great joy. I think if you take joy, which is a fruit of the Spirit, into what you're doing, then you find the hope of what the season can be for you. It can be a holiday to celebrate. It can be a holy day if you want to. It can be fun if you make it so. It's kind of like when the Jews wanted to make something fit. You know, they said, okay, now we just had this major revolt against all those who were compromising against godliness. So we killed them. And now we're going to take over the priesthood, which they did. The Hasmonean dynasty was begun in the Maccabean revolt. And it was a corrupted priesthood. But they said, well, you know, now that we've kind of like, you know, gotten into positions of authority and we've kind of revolted against the Seleucid Empire and all this kind of like things that are, you know, influencing, we say are influencing, you know, godliness, then let's turn it around away from the whole idea of the revolution we've made against these empires and let's try to make it fit God's purpose. So they too, likewise, took a time of year the 25th of Kislev, but the, the Hanukkah time. And they said, you know, let's dedicate the temple, you know. Sure, it got desecrated, and that was our fault. Although they don't admit it. But let's go ahead and clean it up. And now that we've got it cleaned up, you know, let's, let's light the menorah. And they found that there wasn't enough oil. But like anybody else, you and I, come on. They kind of kivitzed a little bit, you know, kivetched, you know, a little bit of that shuffle on, you know, hey, we got a political situation here. The people need to be brought back to not revolting, but towards celebrating this time of light, this time of our freedom from being persecuted and being under the the Greek Empire and the Greek influences, so we need to bring back a holiness to God. Let's let's light the menorah, and as they did, maybe they put it out at night. I don't know, but I do know this: the oil didn't last seven days. <laughs> it wasn't a miracle. <laughs> That's such a deal, and every Jew knew it. And some of it was recorded and treated as you know not part of the holy scriptures and that's why it's not because it's not really a miracle but the point of it was a good holiday to celebrate so it kind of got built up that way well let's let's build it up this way and then eventually later down the road they started kind of manipulating it by changing god's holy menorah into this hanukkah thing that kind of started making up, you know, little little ideas about it, you know, kind of kind of like pagan, kind of like, you know, what people say Santa Claus is, although that's not pagan, or like the Christmas tree is, although that's not pagan. But they started making up these ideas about having like a servant candle, you know, and how it'll light the other ones and certain ways to do it. And in typical fashion, like most men do, they made up a lot of ideas that became kind of popular to do. Then when Christmas came along, of course, wow, they had to bring Hanukkah back and make it bigger than it is, you know? Because it really wasn't celebrated much at all, except maybe in darkest times when sometimes people needed something to cling to, to have hope. So you see, sometimes the holidays aren't about the reality of what they are factually, but what they point to hopefully. Because that's what Hanukkah was about. It was about pointing with hope towards the future. And Jesus, he didn't necessarily honor it. He gave a meaning to it by saying, I am the light of the world during the Feast of the Dedication of the Temple. And the Feast of the Dedication is not Hanukkah. <laughs> the Feast of the Dedication is the Feast of Dedication. Hanukkah today has nothing to do with the Feast of Dedication. It's a difference, believe me. Ooh, like night and day. <laughs> they didn't even have the same menorah. <laughs> Boy. But anyways, the point is, nowadays, for a Jew to celebrate Hanukkah, you know, they take a little dreidel and they have a little top and they play with some little, you know, 
guilt, you know, some little coins, you know, to play with and to have fun with family and friends, you know, and to kind of enjoy the holidays without it being a Christian thing. And they do okay, you know. There's the Hanukkah bush. <laughs> oh, sorry. You didn't know there was a Hanukkah bush? It's a pagan thing. Trust me, it's from Isaiah. You know, we take a bush, we carve it up, we make it after gold, you know, and we put tinsel on it, we put lights on it, and then we bow down and worship it. No, there's no Hanukkah bush or a Hanukkah bush any more than there's a Christmas tree bush or a Christmas tree, you know, pagans. But the point is, the hope that is restored this time of year is all based upon the idea of what you make it is what it can be. This holiday season can be a season of joy. It can be a season of hope. It can be a season of looking to Jesus and enjoying the fact that glad tidings of great joy came into the world, that there should be coming and one day will be peace on earth, goodwill, or God's will toward men, toward all men. And you can enjoy that part of it. But you can also, in the freedom and the joy that God has given us, celebrate if you want to. I mean, hey, look at what the Messianics did. Of course, they're always messing something up. But the Messianics now have tried to make Jesus into the Hanukkah, which, boy, talk about really twisting it. First, you got, you got, you got to think about this. It's kind of funny in a way, because first you have the Catholics turning around and wanting to take a holiday for Jesus' birthday. So they make that up, and then they start adding some traditions in to, you know, kind of mix it up and have a good time, and you know, without being ungodly and pagan. Then you turn around and you got the Jews who want to make a certain holiday for being religious, and so they kind of mix it up and turn it around and try to make it sound more holy than it is. Then you get the Messianics come along and they want to put Jesus in the middle of it and say, oh, but we're going to put Jesus in there and now we're going to say that the, the serpent candle is the, the, the Messiah. He's the light of the world and that he's the, even though it's the ninth candle, not the eighth, that because there's eight, not nine, or nine, not eight, and that there really there's not seven, there's seven, there's eight, there's one, there's one makes or one makes nine, but it's not really counting that, so we don't count that one, so there's really eight, but it's really nine. So we're going to manipulate this to make it fit Jesus. So they came along with all these ideas that somehow it's Jesus in it. <laughs> but hey, if you want to, then enjoy that time too. Or enjoy the Jewish tradition of family and dreidels and guilt and have fun with that. But you can also enjoy Santa Claus too. You see, Santa Claus probably is the only Christian tradition we got. Oh sure, the St. Nicholas thing is the Christian part. but. The Santa Claus part isn't such a bad deal either, because after all, look at what I've done with everything else. Hey, <laughs> might as well. But what you enjoy, you will bring joy to. What you don't enjoy, then you will bring frustration to. And since it's a time of hope, a time of peace, a time of God's will towards men, take whatever celebrations and make them into your time to enjoy. Enjoy Rudolph. Enjoy Frosty the Snowman. I mean, I'm sure that, you know, if you were living in a desert, you know, you wouldn't even have a clue what a snowman was. But nowadays, with television, everybody gets to learn what snowmen are. Or if you were living in Southern California, you wouldn't be too worried about Christmas trees because you decorate palm trees. <laughs> it's tequila. It's Dos Equis Christmas or whatever they have. I can't remember if it's Dos Equis or, or some beer commercial where they put Jose Cuervo or something or where they show a decorated palm tree on all the commercials and wish you a Feliz Navidad. But uh, the point being is that God doesn't care so much that you're enjoying that. He, what he cares about is that you have him with you to enjoy and participate in the season that he's given you in order to be mindful of him and to know him in a more personal and intimate way. Hope is the atmosphere of the entire Bible, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into the veil in Hebrews 6.19. In the New Testament, the word hope becomes one of the great words that Christ gave us. 
It was a word often used before, but it has received new and wonderful meaning because the Savior took it into his mouth and spoke it. Hope is the music, the drift, the direction of the whole Bible. It sets the heartbeat and atmosphere of the Word of God, meaning as it does the desirable expectation and pleasurable anticipation. Human hopes will fail and throw us down, but the Christian's hope is alive. The Old English word lively meant the word living means now. The word comes from God himself, for it is the strongest word in the Bible for life. It is the word used of God himself when he says he is the living God. So it is that God takes a Christian's hope and touches it with himself and imparts his own livingness to the hope of the believer. A true Christian hope is a valid hope. We have been born of God. There has been a new creation. No emptiness there, no vanity, no dreams that can't come true. We have no great palace of beauty in this world. No Taj Mahal or Buckingham Palace or the White House that can compare with the glory that belongs to the true child of God who has known the major miracle who has been changed by an inward operation of the supernatural grace of God into an inheritance and a living hope. Because you have now that living God in you who is your living hope. Your expectations should rise and you should challenge God and begin to dream high dreams of faith and spiritual anticipation. Remember, you can't out-hope the living God. So in a season which is dedicated to faith, to hope, and to love, in a season that really reminds the world in all of its carols and singing and joy, in all of its cartoons and its characters, in its dissertations and distractions and all of its attractions and everything about it, there's always, always huh, laughter and joy, giving, caring, and one thing that you could bring to it. One thing that you can do more than anything else in this Christmas season, you can bring yourself the living hope. And you can make it into something that way surpasses what you would ever have expected it to be. You see, my wife, before I met her, was really into Christmas. She had, oh, let's see, three kids of her own and adopted, well, I won't say adopted, but they were her kids. Two kids moved in with her and she raised them two or three, and so she had always like five or six kids in her family that she was raising. And so she had a household and a household, and she never lived her own dreams really, but she took care of the family. They did lots of things together, and she had some rough relationships in her marriages, and you know, that's for her to tell, but there was always her joy of having that Christmas because she was like from the East Coast where they have the ringing of the bells. She was from Massachusetts where they have like old traditions that go on at this time of year. She was actually one of those that came over and she is a blue blood from, of all things, the Mayflower. <laughs> She's one of those. and. Being one of those, she has in her heart of hearts really an innocency and a, a beauty of what she really would like to have had, had it not been for the circumstances of her life, such as they worked out. She would have wanted so much more. And for one Christmas when I was back there helping her mother pass away, she was dying of cancer, we spent a Christmas there and we got a chance to go around to some of the little quaint towns that are in Hyannisburg and all that stuff where she's at, you know, Cape Cod and there. She was born there. And uh, it was beautiful. It was traditional. It looked like something out of a Norman Rockwell picture and I was amazed to see it. 
and it kind of touched me, you know, it touched my heart because most of my stuff is more like a gospel experience, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I had fun, you know, and over the years, you know, now I've gone out of my way to. We don't do much for Christmas because we really can't afford it, but we do a little bit, you know. We'll decorate some trees a little bit, you know, play with some things, but. Most of the time, I send her to her family to spend it with her children that have grown up and her grandchildren that are far away. And she gets a chance to do those traditions. It's fun. They have all kinds of little things they do, like, you know what they are. And so I, I smile and I have great hope for the day that we all might one day have a Merry Christmas in Heaven and a marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, wouldn't that be something if Jesus said to you, Merry Christmas, and blew your mind? I think so.